Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're very happy to have Julia Argus speak about the higher dimensional tropical vertex. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And what I'm going to talk about today is of uh, joint work with Mark Ross on the higher dimensional tropical vertex. So the setup is very similar as Mark had already talked. We look at local VR pairs, X, uh, which are given by endomanchinous student projected varieties, uh, X, and reduced normal crossing devices with uh, anti-canonical devices, D. And we are going to denote DI, the irreducible components of D, and as marked it, we are going to assume that he is maximally degenerate, namely that there is a set DJ of components of D such that the intersection is non-empty and zero dimensional. A trivial example of a local ABR pair is if you consider a smooth project of toric variety and take D the union of toric boundary devices. This would give you a trivial uh, example. And a more interesting example of a local BR pair is if you start with a smooth projective toric variety uh, and choose general hypersurfaces inside some uh, toric devices of this toric variety. And if you take X, the blow up of this toric variety along these hypersurfaces in its toric boundary. Uh, so I denote these hypersurfaces by H, the union of H1 to HS, uh, which are hypersurfaces in the toric boundary of a toric variety. And then uh, you can take D to be the strict transform of the union of toric boundary devices. And this also gives a maximally degenerate local BR pair XD. Uh, given XD, a maximum degenerate local ABR pair, the complement of U and D is a uh, U of D in X is a non compact uh, Calabia variety. And SYZ mirror symmetry predicts that you should admit a Lagrangian torus vibration and that the mirror of U should be constructed by dualizing this torus vibration. And then by correcting the resulting complex structure using counts of mass of index zero holomorphic disks with boundary on the SYZ torus fibers. So this is what SYZ predicts. And what we are uh, talking of is an algebra geometric realization of this idea. So we are replacing counts of mass of index zero disks by counts of punctured log maps, which we define algebra geometrically. And we use these counts to construct a canonical scattering diagram um, constructed in dimension two by Grossack and Kiel and, and high dimensions by Gross Siebert that Mark just talked of. And we reconstruct the mirror from this canonical scattering diagram. So for XT toric, you will be C star to N. And this admits a smooth Lagrangian torus vibration and in this case, there are no mass of index zero holomorphic disks. The canonical scattering diagram is essentially trivial in this case. And the mirror is just a dual of C star to N. However, if you look at uh, local VR pairs XT obtained from a toric pair by a blow up of hypersurfaces in its toric boundary, then uh, U is no longer C star to N. And the Lagrangian torus vibration in this case necessarily has singularities. And there are non-trivial mass index zero disks and the canonical scattering diagram can be very non-trivial. And what we prove in the higher dimensional tropical vertex with Mark Cross is in this case, when XT is obtained from a toric pair by a blow up of hypersurfaces in a toric boundary, uh, the canonical scattering diagram admits a completely algorithmic description. And this algorithmic description is useful because we use this description to concrete, compute, compre compute concretely uh, punctured log Ramavitan invariants of such pairs. Okay. So uh, what I will be talking of uh, is 
First, I will review the two-dimensional case, the canonical scattering diagram of gross sucking here. And I will review the two-dimensional construction of the tropical vertex, which is due to gross pandery panda and seabed. Uh, and in this setup, uh, gross pandery panda seabed given an emirative interpretation of the canonical scattering diagram using log maps. And uh, in the higher dimensional case, the canonical scattering diagram is constructed by gross and seabed. And we discuss an emirative interpretation of the higher dimensional canonical scattering uh, diagram using punctured log maps. And we show that this enumerative interpretation can be understood purely algorithmically in our work with Mark Kreis in the higher dimensional tropical vertex, generalizing the previous results of gross ponder ponder z but to higher dimensions. So if you look at the two-dimensional case, if you look at a local ABR pair XD, which is obtained from a toric surface, X bar D bar, by blow up of finitely many smooth points of the uh, divisor D bar. Then, uh, for instance, if you can take X bar D bar, toric blow up of P2 and two points, which would give you the toric variety DP7. And uh, you can take XD, Obtaining by, uh, obtained by blowing up further two smooth points on distinct components of D bar, which would give you the pixel surface DP5, which is no more toric. And uh, so below in this picture, I drew the analogy of the momentum cone in this case. So if you had just this five cone, this would be the momentum cone of uh, DP7. And uh, if you blow up further two points, you get an almost toric based diagram defined by Margaret Symington, which has some integral affine singularities. And the uh, dual to it naturally also admits some uh, integral affine structure with singularities. So the canonical scattering diagram is a canonical scattering diagram uh, attached to XD, is a union of pairs, rho and F rho where rho are worms, which are co-dimension one sense of BP that Mark had discussed, the fan picture of XD. And uh, the wall crossing functions of rho are attached to worms, and these functions instruct us how to transform monomials across worms. So in the case, uh, as Mark had already mentioned, B is the dual intersection complex, which is a union of two dimensional cones corresponding to the zero dimensional strata of D. And we do not buy P the corresponding cone decomposition of B. Uh, we define an integral fine structure away from the origin from the intersection pattern of this uh, D B fix. And walls of D are recent B coming out from the origin. And for every cone, uh, uh, how do we describe the attached slot functions? We look at integral tangent vectors for a, for a cone sigma, whose direction is contained in sigma. And if beta is a curve plus in an EY, the cone of effective curves of Y, and if we let n v beta be the genus zero locrum of its invariant, counting rational curves in X of class beta, intersecting D at a single point with contact order V, then uh, we define the attached functions to the wall R greater or equal zero V as exponential K times N V beta T to the beta Z to minus V. And in the canonical scattering diagram, the here k is the divisibility of the vector v, which is the integer uh, k times the, so v is a vector which is k times um, a primitive vector. And uh, so the attached slip functions admit coefficients given in terms of locrum of its invariance in the two dimensional case. And uh, the attached functions to each wall are elements of, uh, in, uh, as seen here, the elements of um, K 
Q and E Y, so the coefficient ring is uh, defined in terms of the Morricone. There are Laurent polynomials with coefficients um, capturing um, the, with coefficients in the monoid ring def uh, defined by the Morricone. Um, I will just give an example of the canonical scattering diagram for this DP7 we had just talked of. Uh, so in DP7, you have this integral affine manifold with a singularity in the middle, which is which can be taught as the dual to this almost toric based diagram. So it has five rays, and in the middle there, are sing there is a singularity because we had pushed on singularities one blowing up non torically. And uh, attached step functions are of the form one plus ci inverse c to ei where each EI is a minus one curve class intersecting the boundary at one single point. So for instance, here you attach the function one plus C1 inverse C to E1. And E1 in this picture, here I drew E1 actually, there is some construction using the conormal bundle. So E1 has uh, admits a torus vibration, uh, sorry, a vibration by a circles. And if you look at this curve inside the almost torque based diagram, E1 um, corresponds to this curve. And E2 corresponds to this curve. So over this curve, there's a sphere corresponding to E2. And there are uh, three more of such curves, which I didn't draw, that starts from this vertex going to the opposite side, from this vertex going to this side, and um, a last one going through these two vertices and uh, hitting T4 at one point. And um, apart from the four, uh, five boundary devices, D1 to D5, these EIs, um, there are five of these EIs. In total, we have 10 minus one curves in this example, which uh, are the full set of extremal rays of the Morricone and EY. And the canonical scattering diagram includes the information of all of these curves. Um, so you have, in the canonical scattering diagram, you have five balls given by these five rays and the attached functions are uh, one plus zi inverse e to ei for i running from one to five. And the way we do check consistency of the canonical scattering diagram in dimension two is uh, you uh, reduce uh, everything to the gross but locus in the setup of gross but originally uh, there are no singularities at zero dimensional toric strata. And here we do have a singularity, which is bad, but checking consistency, we want to go around loops and um, take composition of the wall crossing functions. But if there's a singularity in the middle, that makes life very challenging. So you pull the singularity apart and reduce things to the gross but locus. So it amounts to dividing the ray corresponding to one plus E1 inverse C to E1, for instance, if you pull the singularity apart like two singularities, uh, it amounts to dividing the ray into two rays with sub functions that have inverse powers. So if this is one plus E1 inverse C to E1, here you would have one plus C1, Z2 minus E1. Okay, so this is the way a uh, technique to check consistency of the canonical scattering diagram. And if you push the singularities all the way to infinity, you would obtain a toric scattering diagram, but I will refer to, which has no singularities. So I would like to also mention here of this slide, which is not terribly crucial for this talk, but may be interesting to motivate the description of the canonical scattering diagram and how do we construct mirrors out of the canonical scattering diagram. So we do write theta functions. And um, you can imagine that theta functions are like corresponding to integral points in the cone picture of a toric variety. If you have the momentum cone, uh, then each integral point corresponds to a section of an ample line bundle. And similarly, we define, th integral we define theta functions for the mirror uh, given by integral points of the quantum picture of the mirror. But the quantum picture of the mirror by this SYC duality is actually the fan picture of the original log Calabiao you start with. So if you look at points and the fan picture of the log Calabiao, 
And um, we describe each theta function. Here I wrote a couple of theta functions. So uh, they, in the, I derived the theta functions in the reduction to the gross Seebert locus in this diagram. So here, uh, if I, in every chart, like in the lower left chart, I wrote Z1 and Z2. So in this chart, they correspond to theta functions, theta one and theta two. So theta functions are in correspondence with um, sums of broken lines that emerge from one unbounded direction. And if you fix any point, they, uh, which converge to that point. So if you um, look at the wall crossing algorithm, uh, the scattering algorithm market mentioned, um, this algorithm is compatible with how broken lines change across chambers. So if I have my variable z1 here, uh, it crosses this wall on the bottom and it's, it's, it changes from z1 to z1 times the wall crossing function, z1 times z plus z2, z2 minus z2. So my wall crossing function was here. And there are also kinks of a piecewise senior multivalued piecewise senior function. I also multiply with that kink. So my new Z1 becomes in this chart Z1 times all these factors. And in this chart, I don't have Z1, Z2 coordinates, but my coordinates are Z2, Z3. So I replace Z1 by Z3 inverse using the toric relation that Z1 points to this direction, Z3 points to this direction, and Z1 is Z3 inverse. So if I would write my theta function theta one in this chart, it would be written like this. And um, why is this wall crossing compatible with the combinatorics of broken lines? Uh, so while crossing the wall, I multiply z1 with z1 times one times something times some coefficient. So it reads as z1 plus z1 z2 times some coefficient. And this corresponds to the fact that when I pass to this side, if I come from the z1 direction, I either go straight or I can bend in the direction of the broken line. And so I have two broken lines coming from z1 direction that converge to this point. And this uh, includes in itself in the wall crossing algorithm that I have z1 times some coefficients plus z1, z2 times some coefficients. So I define how broke, we define how broken lines change across chambers compatibly with the wall crossing algorithm. And so if you write all of your theta functions, uh, for instance, in this chamber, I had written three of them in the upper right chamber where z3 and z4, if I fix any point in the upper right chamber, Z3 and Z4 come directly to that point without bending. So my theta function, theta3 is Z3, theta4 is Z4. And if I want to define theta2, I need to cross this wall. Similarly, that I crossed um, Z1 here, I would cross Z2, Z2 times this wall crossing function attached to the ray going to the right side and times the kink, which gives me this description. I will obtain Z2 times this one plus C3 inverse C2 E3 C2 D3, the kink. And uh, at the end, I want to write everything in coordinates C3, Z4. So I replace C2 by Z4 inverse C3 using the torque relation. And theta 2 becomes this. Similarly, I can write theta 1 and theta 5 by crossing all these walls. And once you have a, a consistent scattering diagram, you can write all of your theta functions in one given chamber. And then you do know what your mirror is. Your mirror is given by the spec C uh, generated by all these theta functions. Modulo the relation theta i minus one, theta i plus one equals z to di, theta i plus c to ei in this case. So this is an affine variety, which is the mirror to dp5 minus the boundary divisor. And you can already see if you multiply theta four by theta two, you get what uh, is written here. You get C3, um, you get C to the I parentheses C3 plus C to EI. And um, if you write theta one and theta five, you can see actually this is the relation that is satisfied by all five of the theta functions. There is some C5 symmetry here actually. 
So once you do know, the cool thing about this consistent scattering diagrams is once you do know you have a consistent scattering diagram, you can pick up any chamber you wish, it won't matter, and you can write your theta functions and you know what the mirror to your uh, given local ABO is. And as Mark had mentioned, the uh, crucial information about this canonical scattering diagram is that it is described purely in terms of enumerative geometry of local ABR pairs. So I would like to talk about this enumerative problem because I will describe this enumerative problem in higher dimensions and I will explain how we compute the enumerative invariance we describe algorithmically. So in dimension two, the enumerative problem is this. Uh, you think beta, um, a curve class in H2 XZ, sorry, there is a typo, I switch between XC and YD while defining the chemical scattering diagram. You fix a curve class beta in, the, in, uh, in, in, your, in the homology of your local ABI pair X and, and X. And um, you and uh, you fix rays with primitive generators corresponding to devices di and di plus one. And then you also fix a vector v a m i plus uh, b times m i plus one where a and b are non-negative integers. So in this setup uh, in b, uh, it amounts to fixing a two-dimensional cone in dimension two and I fix a vector v uh, with coordinates a b here. And the question we are trying to answer here is, what is the number of genus zero curve curves in X, which is equal to Y here, because I swapped between X and Y, they are the same, of class beta, which intersects D at a single point with multiplicity AB along, um, along TI and TI plus one respectively. So uh, I want to understand, so I have these devices di and di plus one. I want to understand curves which intersect di plus one with multiplicity i and di with multiplicity b, with contact order b. But what I do impose is I want my curves to touch the boundary only at one point. So they cannot be like in the middle picture. But a possible interpretation is they can be like in the most right picture. So if I want contact or the AB, my curve can intersect this nodal point, which is the point of intersection DI and DI plus one. And to such curve, I'm going to include in my canonical scattering diagram a vector V going through A and B, which is also the tropical interpretation of such a curve. If you have um, such a curve with one component touching the boundary at one point, tropically it corresponds to you have one vertex mapping to the origin and one ray animating out of the origin. So this is the kind of uh, curves we are looking and they tropically can be interpreted and there is the result of course from the Zeba showing that actually this tropical interpretation is crucial while defining the consistent scattering diagrams. They show that every outgoing ray in a consistent scattering diagram they describe corresponds to such a tropical curve. And then you can use the tropical correspondence theorems, Nishino Zibat or Mikakin emerging from those a priori um, to show that they do give the correct uh, enumerative invariance we claim. Um, okay, so um, I will describe a two-dimensional toric scattering diagram, uh, which will let us understand, which will uh, encode all the information um, to construct a canonical scattering diagram. So in the two-dimensional case, if you uh, fix um, toric surface X sigma and a collection of hypersurfaces, uh, H, uh, which consists of finitely many smooth points in the toric boundary of sigma. Then we can define algorithmically without using enumerative geometry a scattering diagram dx sigma H in R2. And to define this, we start with the toric fan sigma of x sigma. And for every ray rho i of sigma, we let mi be the primitive in integral, uh, primitive, sorry, uh, generator integral primitive generator of rho i and let h i, uh, h i j uh, be the set of points on the device of rho i that will 
be blown up to obtain x. Then, uh, out, of, from the, out of this data of a toric surface with the data of the points I fix on its boundary that I will blow up to obtain my local ABL, I'm going to describe a scattering diagram by first constructing an initial set of force, my initial scattering diagram in R2, which will correspond to rho i, the walls will be those one dimensional rays rho i, uh, together with attached functions t i plus tij z to mi. So this is the fund purely algorithmically. I have variables tij, no more econ coefficients at the moment. And then um, we shall note that the scattering diagram, the initial scattering diagram is not co consistent because composition around zero of the automorphisms defined by the walls is not going to be the identity. But uh, we can define uh, d, uh, dx sigma h as a minimal consistent scattering diagram containing the initial scattering diagram. And there is an algorithmic way to construct such a consistent scattering diagram containing an initial scattering diagram we define. And this is due to considered Soibelman in dimension two and cross Hebert in higher dimensions. So whenever this uh, in dimension two known as the considered Soibelman lemma is saying that whenever you have a set of rays with attached subfunctions, there is a way to add more and more arrays with um, attached subfunctions that are described algorithmically such that the scattering diagram will be consistent. And the theorem in dimension two, which is intrinsic in the paper of Grossack and Kiel, is that the canonical scattering diagram and the toric scattering diagram determine each other. So you can uh, describe the canonical scattering diagram associated to a local ABR pair from a toric scattering diagram associated to a toric variety along with the data of uh, the hypersurfaces you fix to blow up. And um, so to understand this theorem, what you need to do is you need to translate the variables TIGs appearing in the toric scattering diagram into curve classes on X. Um, so TIJs are related to the exceptional divisors EIJs in X obtained by blowing up the point HIJ on the toric divisor D rho I. So the translation between the toric scattering diagram which involves variables TIs and the canonical scattering diagram amounts to replacing those variables with curve classes. And um, this theorem it's nice because it's, it gives an efficient way to compute the low-chroma written invariance and the beta purely algorithmically, which are algebra geometric versions of counts of mass index zero disks, and so the mirror symmetry. So um, the crucial thing here is we know how to Algorithmically using commutative formulas and to consider Sobelman or gross that algebraic procedure to obtain a consistent scattering diagram once you start with the toric scattering diagram with variables Tij's. And um, we will see examples at the end of the talk how this describes the punctured low chroma written invariance in higher dimensions. So maybe before passing to the higher dimensional case, uh, is it, it's already around half an hour. Maybe I reserve the other half an hour to describe the higher dimensional case. Is it a good time to stop and to have the discussion time? Yes, uh, that sounds great. Let's, um, let's take a pause here. And are there any questions uh, people would like to ask at this time? Maybe I could ask a kind of a beginner's question. This scattering diagram, um, this D in, from which you get the consistent scattering diagram D, how, uh -huh. um, can you say why D in is not consistent? That's a good question. So um, if I look at the toric variety, toric variety say DP7, um, imagine uh, the toric fan of DP7, which looks similar to the right-hand side picture, apart from the fact that you don't have any singularity at the origin. And imagine all of your um, 
functions attached to each ray of the toric scattering diagram are identity. Then this would be a consistent scattering diagram associated to the toric variety. This would be essentially the toric fan. So, and from the toric fan, you know how to construct EP7. So each cone is going to correspond to um, an affine um, A2. And you have these five affine A2s, since you glue them together without doing something very non-trivial while passing from chamber to, a, to another chamber. So, I mean, if on this side, your variables on the bottom left are uh, Z1, Z2, you, your variables on the bottom right are Z2, Z3. But when you um, blow up toric varieties and push in singularities, then what you can imagine as your initial scattering diagram um, uh, changing the sub-functions from identity to some non-trivial functions on these corresponding rays. So here I wrote 1 plus C to EI, Z1 inverse, 1 plus C to E2, Z2 inverse. And actually, the, in the toric scattering diagram, I don't use the notation, we don't use the notation Z to EIs, but we just say TIJs. So um, without even blowing up, uh, while defining the toric scattering diagram, we know the data that we will blow up those points. And when we know the data, we will blow up those points on those corresponding devices. We just do change our usual identity functions in the toric case to non-trivial functions, one plus TIJ Z1 inverse and one plus, in this case, uh, one plus TIJ Z2 inverse. So this is not going to be consistent because you changed only the two of them to identity. So if you, uh, want to do the consistency check, um, you can start with the monoid Z1 here and carry it across the wall. So when you carry Z1 across this wall, this is going to be carried across the bottom row as I had written somewhere. Um, here. Uh, so Z1 is going to be carried to this side of the wall by multiplication by Z1 times. In the toric scattering diagram, you would only have 1 plus Z2 times T2. And then you continue carrying it all the way back to the first chamber. So if you would have just... Um, let me come back to the picture I was showing you with the toric thing. Here, if you just continue carrying everything, which would not change while crossing these walls, if these walls would remain identity, then you would only need to cross one more wall here and come back to the original thing. But you would see that if you take the composition, you don't come back as Z1. So if you do the computation, which I'm happy to do actually, uh, depending on how long the discussion remains, we have some more minutes, maybe it's a good thing to do this computation, you don't come back to Z1. Uh, so this means you cannot get consistency by changing to on, only these two uh, initial uh, walls. But you do need to change the other three walls also, which correspond to identity with some non-trivial step functions. And the theorem is saying that if you do change them to, and if you add walls as um, many as there are non-trivial curve classes, so here I also have three more non-trivial uh, E2, E3, and E4. So if I add everything, and if I change my uh, sub-functions which were a priori identity in the toric case to non-trivial sub-functions which would encode all these non-trivial curve classes, I will really return back to Z1. And this is some um, computation which we can do happily if there are no other questions, maybe, because it will take 10 minutes or so. Maybe I, I can just add, so, so the main point is that if you go around that loop, uh, you don't get um, uh, the, you get a commutator of automorphisms, but they don't commute. 
And the original statement of the of conservator Solomon in the 2004 paper was that you could express a commutator as a product of all the morphisms associated with, with a whole bunch of gradients. That was really what got the story started. Let's see. Are there any questions people want to ask uh, um, before maybe seeing the computation? <laughs> <laughs> I hope I uh, didn't start up for something. Mark, are you here? I know that it's uh, live scaling competition. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Do you want me to walk away? Yes, thanks. <laughs> Correct me. Yeah. I, in a way, it's, it's a, well, it's a computation that everyone should do for themselves. So we just do the toric computation with one plus c one and one plus c two. Yeah. So um, if you have, I unfortunately you cannot write on the laptop. It would be a good excuse to ask Mark to write this if you can, maybe. If you want me to do it, I can do it. It will take me a second to hook up mine. I do, yeah, because it will take me not a second but ten minutes. Yeah, please do if you can. I have to rejoin uh, with my icon. Okay, perfect. But I think then you have to end share screen so I can share my screen. All right. Um, just a second. You're sharing screen. You. Uh, I don't want new share. Stop share. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I should be able to share my screen. And then. Okay, that's my screen. And then my notes are here. So the whoop. Scattering diagram looks like this. So let's start. Uh, well, I don't know where we want to start, but let's. Um, so I'm going to have one plus x. I mean, I'm going to have one plus y. I don't. We don't need to worry about the uh, uh, the coefficients. Um, and so going this way, uh, x will be invariant. X goes to x, and y goes to y times one plus x. Going this way, it's uh, y will be invariant. So now x goes to um, x times, uh, I can start my video, um, x times 1 plus uh, y inverse. There are some sign conventions about crossing this. So when you cross one direction, you'll get it on morphs. And when you cross the other direction, you'll get the inverse. So here it's x goes to x. Uh, y goes to y and one plus x inverse. Uh, so now you can just run through. Um, let's see if we go like this. Let's check x. x goes to x goes to x times one plus y inverse uh, goes to um, x times one plus y times one plus x inverse inverse. Um, and this I didn't write down. This is. Um, uh, x goes to x times 1 plus y, and y goes to y, so that then goes to x times 1 plus y times 1 plus y times 1 plus x times 1 plus y. Somehow I have the feeling that it's not quite that messy. Um, Anyway, you have to convince yourself that's not x, but it isn't. Uh. <laughs> I, I might have gotten some sign conventions wrong, but really the important point. So that's, I don't think that's really the calculation you should do. The calculation you should do is to add to the output ray, uh, which has the function one plus x, y attached to it. And crossing this should take uh, x to x times one plus x, y 
inverse and y goes to um, sorry did I have to think about the sign convention here uh, y goes to y times 1 plus xy inverse I don't know if I did this wrong here uh, so then what you should do is incorporate that automorphism in it which would mean that at this fourth step I go to x times 1 plus x y. I hope this is going to be right because this is a pretty dull calculation to sort of watch someone doing. Um, 1 plus y times 1 plus x y inverse times 1 plus x times 1 plus x y inverse. Um, Um, hopefully that's right. Now we have to simplify. Oh, Mandy says she thinks the sign is flipped. Mandy Chen. That could well be. Um, Mandy, where where is my sign flipped? I don't know, because here you're doing the GPS calculation, right? Yeah. So you are doing the the normal with the direction of the loop. Oh yeah, sorry. The um, but here you're doing the opposite normal. Is that I didn't check carefully. Right. Yeah, I think I'm not using a GPS convention here. Yeah, but you are your wall function are the GPS wall function here. Um, well, that's so, why I had this going. So these in the non-GPS convention. Are you having more noise? Like, no, but you should have cancellation. Like it. It's not correct because. <laughs> Yeah. Your foot, your, yeah, let, your let's, 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 should have, you should have cancelled out something already and then... Yeah. I, I, I have a suggestion. Let's not do this live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Sorry. I just felt funny. Sorry for interrupting. No problem. Okay. That's all good. So shall we continue? All right. Let's, let's continue and, and maybe at the end if someone has, a, has it written up at that point, they can just kind of, you know, flash it on the screen so we can see it. <laughs> Wonderful. So right, let's continue. I hope I shared my screen correctly. Uh, so do you see my slides again at the moment? Can someone confirm? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, we were just going to begin at the higher dimensional case. Um, so in the high dimensional case, we look at n-dimensional locally VR pairs obtained from a torque variety x bar d bar by a blow up of finitely many general hypersurfaces contained in the reducible components of d bar. As an example, we can start with P3. And d bar is the sum of the toric boundary devices. And we can take h to be the union of a line in one of the toric boundary devices d1 bar. And uh, second line in the other toric boundary device, the D2 bar. So assume that L1 and L2 are chosen generally so that they do not intersect, then X equal, um, if you look at X, which is the blow up of L1 union L2, this is an interesting uh, Fano variety, appears in the Mori Mukai classification of Fano varieties and M25, I think. And uh, if you look at the dual intersection complex of this xd uh, with the cone decomposition p, whose cones are one to one correspondence with the strata of d, uh, in particular, the zero dimensional strata of d corresponds to n dimensional cones of p. If we define, and we define the integral defined structure on d as Mark mentioned away from the cones of p of co dimension greater or equal to. Codimension one cones correspond to curve CI contained in D, and the integral defined structure across these codimension one cones is defined in terms of the intersection on the CI intersection DJ. Okay, so I uh, denote again D, the canonical scattering diagram attached to local BR varieties XD in higher dimensions. Walls of D are cones contained in codimension one integral defined subspaces of B. 
And for every sigma a cone in P, V an integral tangent vector to sigma and beta in an EY. If you consider genus zero punctured log maps in X of class beta intersecting T at a point with contact order V, um, then uh, we describe the canonical scattering diagram using this data. And if the direction, I would like to note that if the direction of V is contained in the cone sigma, V only involves non-negative contact or orders and punctured log maps are just usual stable log maps in this case. However, if the direction of V is not contained in the cone sigma, then V involves negative contact orders and the full theory of punctured log maps in this case is necessary. Okay, so um, I want to emphasize this note maybe because um, it is important that in dimension two, we only care about log gram of written invariance while defining the canonical scattering theorem, whereas in higher dimensions, it's more challenging. We do need punctured log maps. So if we look at our picture, the enumerative problem, we are looking at vector V and in dimension two, this vector will always stay inside the two-dimensional cone V. And the reason is, as Mark you, was talking, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, would you be able to make your slides full screen again? Sure. Does that work? Yes, that makes the diagrams larger. Thank you. Thank you. So, and um, the reason is we are looking at families of log or punctured log curves which form dimension x minus two, which are of dimension x minus two, because these dimensional families correspond to zero dimensional strata of the moduli space of such log maps. So in dimension two, these families are zero dimensional and the tropical curve is rigid indeed. So if you look at a tropical curve consisting of only one vertex and one one direction vector, it is rigid only if you map it to the zero dimension strata of the cone. So there is no way to move this. It needs to, the vertex needs to stay at the zero dimension strata. But in higher dimensions, we have one dimensional families of tropical curves. So the vertex can map to anywhere inside a two dimensional cone. And in that case, the direction vector can hit the boundary of other cones. So in this case, the direction vector AB, A uh, can be written as a positive sum of the ray generators corresponding to the divisors and you always have positive contact orders. But in higher dimensions, if AB goes the other way around or it's, if it hits the boundary, then you do get negative contact orders. And that's a crucial thing. In higher dimensions, we look at dimension X minus two dimensional families of tropical curves which are um, correspond, which are um, having one uh, unbounded direction vector and that direction vector doesn't need to stay inside the cone. That's why you do get punctured block invariance in higher dimensions. And um, so continuing to the higher dimensional tropical, high, continuing to the higher dimensional uh, discussion. Sorry. Um, if you look at, um, we made this remark, and if you look at punctured log maps of class beta intersecting T um, with contact order V, uh, if you look at the tropicalizations of such maps, um, these form a family and um, of tropical curves in V with one neck corresponding to the marked point where the contact condition with T is imposed. And the uh, N minus one dimensional balls of T are formed by the union of legs of N minus two dimensional families of punctured log maps. So more precisely for every tau, a type of tropical curve having an N minus two dimensional space of deformation, there is a corresponding moduli space of class beta punctured log maps of virtual dimension zero. And we consider the corresponding invariance market described in this talk and tau beta, which are rational numbers. 
Okay, and the canonical scattering diagram is defined using these invariants to each wall, one dimensional wall, uh, row tau that I denote by the attached set function is defined by, as appeared in Mark's talk, exponential of exponential k tau and tau beta t to beta z minus v. So k tau with a constant number, it can be defined in terms of some lattice indices. And uh, n tau beta is the punctual chromovitin invariance uh, we are uh, having in the description of these walls. And these punctual chromovitin invariants can be um, computed actually, it's not, I mean, it's, if, if, if light would be nice, it would be true what I was saying. I'm slightly hiding some things because you need the technology of art insects and they are slightly more complicated to describe. So it is not in general true that um, when you just look at the moduli space of punctured block maps, it doesn't, um, it doesn't have a nice perfect obstruction theory. And um, what you need to do is to construct the Artin stack. And this is a stack whose zero dimensional strata does correspond to dimension X minus two dimensional families of tropical curves. And it does have a nice perfect obstruction theory, which Abramovich and Grossi, but um, show and it's, in the archive now, their punctured paper, and we do define these entire betas by Manolache's virtual pullback of the virtual fundamental class on the art insect. Okay, so um, in dimension two, the only type of tropical curves with zero dimension modular space, modular space of deformation are rays are greater or equal zero times V with the direction V contained in sigma. And this is why the two-dimensional canonical scattering diagram only involves log and not punctured log as we noted. And in higher dimensions, we do have punctured log maps. So in dimension n greater or equal three, there can exist tropical curves with n minus two dimensional modular space of the formation and with the direction of V not contained in the cone sigma. And the corresponding click will be bounded, either hitting the boundary or another wall and the corresponding proposition is going to give you a punctured point. So if we um, try to describe similarly a toric scattering diagram that would uh, allow us to understand the canonical scattering diagram in higher dimensions purely algorithmically, we do it this way. We look at local BR pairs, XT, uh, where X is obtained by a blow up of a toric variety X sigma at finitely many hypersurfaces in its toric boundary, which these hypersurfaces we always denote by H. And then we can algorithmically define, again, a toric scattering diagram associated to the toric model, the X sigma H and RN. And we do this by starting with the fun. And on the fan for every, on the fan sigma for every ray rho i, uh, we denote by m i the primitive generator of rho i and let h i be the set of connected hypersurfaces h i j contained in the divisor rho i that will be blown up to obtain the x. And if we look at the initial scattering diagram of R n, it will consist of the walls Wij1 plus Tij z to Mij, where Wij are piecewise linear co-dimension one subspaces of Rn, uh, obtained by translating in the direction Mi the tropicalization of Hij. And I will draw pictures of these. These are going to be my balls. And in dimension N3, uh, we call these things widgets. So here, is an example of some widgets. So if I look at the um, tor torque variety P3, and uh, if I fix two lines in P3 contained in the torque boundary device of P2, so I take L1 contained in one of, um, one of the P2s in the torque boundary of P3, and L2 in another P2 in the torque boundary of P3, then the tropicalizations of L1 and L2 are tropical lines. 
And the walls, my initial walls, are obtained by translating these tropicalizations along these rays that correspond to the P2s I fixed originally. So, um, for instance, if I fix L1 and the P2, which corresponds in the toric fan of P3 and the, to the ray um, E2, then I would translate the tropicalization of L1 all the way along E2, and this would give me a co-dimension one wall in the toric fan of P3. And all these walls uh, describe my initial set of walls. So what I had done, I described the toric scattering tangram, where the initial set of walls are determined by uh, the data of the hypersurfaces I'm going to blow up to obtain my local BI variety in higher dimensions. And the historic scattering diagram, uh, we describe an algorithm to complete it to a consistent scattering diagram. This initial one is again not consistent. And if we define uh, the minimal consistent scattering diagram containing the initial scattering diagram, there is a purely algebraic construction to obtain this consistent scattering diagram. And we show that the canonical scattering diagram and the toric scattering diagram do determine each other. And this is a generalization of cross boundary ponder z but to higher dimensions. And it again requires translating variables tij appearing in the toric scattering diagram into curve classes. And this gives an efficient way to compute punctured Bokromov with an invariance, which I will illustrate in an example in the last slides. So um, the proof goes via considering a degeneration of A1, whose general fiber is the local BR variety, and whose special fiber is the toric variety, is the union of a toric variety with um, blown up P1 bundles. So it's like a degeneration to the normal cone. And this, considering this degeneration, allows us to uh, essentially push the singularity away from the origin, which amounts to like reducing to the gross seabed locus and pushing away to the singularity at the end. Okay, so here's an example. Um, if I start with the initial scattering diagram attached to P3 with two lines, so I have my P3, I fixed line one and one of the toric boundary components P2 and my line two and the other toric boundary component P2. And um, using the data of the toric um, variety P3 and these two lines, I defined my initial scattering diagram by just taking the tropicalization of these lines I fix on the, hypo on the toric boundary and by translating them along rays. And then there is a purely algorithmic construction which we describe by, which says how to add more and more walls to the direction of these walls and um, the way you attach functions to these walls such that you obtain a consistent scattering diagram. And in our dimensions, it would amount to by going around loops, go, by taking loops around the joints, which are the places where walls intersect, and ensuring the composition of um, the attached functions give identity. So if I look at the consistent scattering diagram obtained um, by using this procedure, which contains my initial scattering diagram with the initial walls that I had described here. These initial six walls corresponding to the two widgets, then my consistent scattering diagram will have this set of walls um, here. It will have actually, uh, we wrote it as a finitely many set of walls, however, there are factors like 1 plus T2Y, 1 plus T1, T2XY. These factors do come because we actually did have an infinitely, we actually did have infinitely many walls when running this procedure, but those infinitely many walls when on top of each other, they formed infinite power series and those power series converged to these sub functions. Okay, so um, 
this consistence scattering diagram is obtained purely algorithmically. There is a way to tell why you start with 1 plus t1, x1 plus t2, y, by some balancing condition which will to add and what the attached function is. And by translating the TIJ variables into QR classes, we obtain all modes of the canonical scattering diagram, which are listed here. For the local BR variety obtained by blowing up P3 at the union of these two ones, L1 and R2. So we just do this translation. We show that there is a translation uh, changing the variables TRJs to EIJs, and these describe all walls of the canonical scattering diagram. And this gave a purely combinatorial way to us to obtain all walls of the canonical scattering diagram. And these walls with these attached subfunctions do tell us now what the punctured invariants you were looking at are. So if you recall from Mark's talk, the walls attached to canonical scattering diagram are um, described by looking at um, exponential of kt, k tau, some constant times some punctured log invariants, t to beta z minus u. So each of these walls do really describe some punctured invariants. As an example, if you look at the wall, which is the most complicated one that I choose to illustrate uh, with support E1 minus E2, this one. And um, this is the exponential of such a formula. So if we take the logarithm of this, uh, the logarithm of this formula gives you k times minus 1 to the k plus 1 k square k choose l times this formula. And what does it say? It tells us that um, if you look at punctured log maps, which are of class the power of t k times l minus e2 minus l times e1, um, then this formula, this coefficient tells us how many punctured such log maps are. And um, when you do the, I, I mean, the, the thing what we want is the tropicalization of all such punctured log maps to trace out a, this wall that is spanned by E1 and minus E2. But if you do the scattering algorithm, if you run the scattering algorithm, um, there will be some mysterious things happening. So the tropicalization of um, the punctured log maps will not a priori, the lack, um, the, the you will have a family of punctured log maps. And if you look at the, uh, you, if you look at where the lack of these punctured, uh, tropical punctured log maps swept, swept out, they don't swap out the wall a priori, because actually we get, different families of punctured log maps of this curve class. So there are actually in this case two families of punctured log maps of curve class k times l minus e2 minus, minus small l times e1, where l is uh, the class of a line that is obtained as a strict transform of a generic line in p3. e1 is the class of a fiber over l1. e2 is the class of a fiber over e2. Uh, L2. So if I want to obtain a map of class k times L minus E2, k times, there's a parenthesis should be here, of this class as in the power of t, minus small l times E1, there's a typo with the parenthesis here, the correct thing is as the power of t, then I can obtain such punctured flock maps this way. So if I look at k fold multiple covers of lines in P3, uh, as I drew on the left bottom picture. So if you look at a line that intersects like a green line uh, that intersects L1 and L2 and passes through this point, then this line will correspond to a curve of class L minus E1 minus E2. And if I look at k-fold multiple colors of such line, such k-fold multiple colors will give me curve classes which uh, of class k times l minus e1 minus e2. So my aim is to obtain curve classes k times l minus e1 minus e2 plus k minus l times e1, which would give me the correct power of the curve class over t. 
So what I do is I look at this point, the inverse image of this point consists of k points. I have a k-fold cover and I choose k minus L of these k points and I attach P1s to these k minus L of uh, these points. And so I map those P1s to the exceptional fiber over L1. And at times, if I do this construction, such maps will give me the correct, correct class. And there's a one-dimensional family of such maps. Um, but there's another family which gave this class and which touched the boundary at one point. The other family is obtained by, if you look at maps that have three reducible components, and one of the reducible components are um, mapping to k minus l times multiple covers of curves that correspond to class l minus e2. So which curves are class of class l minus e2? If you start with a vertex at the back and draw a line that intersects l2, then the strict transform of such a line will be of class l minus e2. And if we look at k minus l multiple colors of such lines, they will be of this class. And so you can look at a line, uh, which again I drew in green, that um, start from the corner on the back, intersect l1 at a point and intersect l2 at a point and that lie in the historic boundary divisor. The strict transform of such lines will be of class l minus e1 minus e2. And I look at I fold multiple covers of such lines. So I get the correct class and so I connect these two different multiple covers by imposing another P1 which gets contracted to the corner. These also give a one dimensional family of lines. They also give the correct class. The thing is, if I look at the tropical families corresponding to these lines, uh, so both are one dimensional families so the first family consists of two vertices and one unbounded edge that I drove in the first picture here. And this vertex can go all the way from zero to in the x direction. And it swaps, uh, the leg swaps out the region drawn in the first picture. If, if I look at the second family, the second family has three reducible components, one at origin, one at the x-axis, one at the y-axis, if you draw these tropically, and it swaps out, out this region. And there is some cancellation occurring, so if you consider these two families together, you really end up only with the region E1, E2. And this was my last slide, actually. Maybe I can tell just a couple of words what I mean by cancellation. So, um, so there are, if you look at the first family, you get a coefficient given by minus one to the k plus one over your k squared times k choose l. And the reason is, so k is the k tau factor Mark mentioned, and the reason is minus one to the k plus one over k squared is the multiple cover formula. So if you look at all multiple covers of k fold covers of such lines I drew here, that gives the minus one to the k plus one over k square. And there are k choose l ways to attach p ones to the k points, um, to the k minus l points among the k points. So I looked at the inverse image of this point in my curve and I choose k minus l among them to attach p ones that would map to the exception locus. So this choice gives the factor here k choose l. So you really get this coefficient. And if you look at the second family, similarly, if you analyze, you again get this coefficient, but there are two multiple color formulas. So rather than the only difference will be, rather than minus one to the k plus one, you be able to get minus one to the k. So these two families will just contribute to the very same coefficient with different signs. And because they contribute with different signs, on these regions, actually, they do, so their product, so if you look at one plus x and one plus y, their product does not have a term of order one. So at each order, the product cancels and gives identity of that order and the k order scattering. And that's why the two families, which happen to trace different regions, actually, at, the, at some overlaps, they cancel each other and you do really get the correct region where the tropical maps trace. And 
um, it gives the correct computation. So I think this is probably a good point to stop. I already uh, 45, probably that's the right time. Thank you for your patience for this link. Maybe I can stop sharing my screen. Great, thanks for the great talk. Let's thank Kulia. Thank you.